It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad that uh, the topic of psychedelics is something that we can bring up from uh, the quiet places and talk about it here directly. Um, so first, what I want to talk about um, is a little bit of um, why psychedelics, why it's really important beyond just mental health. And what really inspired me when I was 18 back in 1972 to devote my life to psychedelics was um, this sense, uh, as Albert Einstein has said, it's become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. So I was um, educated about the Holocaust. I was involved in as a little boy in school when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. And then the final sort of trauma of my life was being in, uh, in one of the last years of the lottery for Vietnam. And so I really was very appalled by the murderous nature of the human heart. I mean, we've just heard from the president of Rwanda, and that's another terrible example of that. And, and so I just, out of desperation and out of fear about um, how I, you could be um, physically, financially successful, that you could still be um, killed in any number of different ways, it, it really moved me towards trying to study psychology, depth psychology. And I think what, what Einstein is pointing to is that we have developed our minds in an incredible way, but our, our emotions and our spirituality, our emotional maturity has lagged way behind. And so we have this need, this desperate, dire need to really move forward as quickly as we can in this emotional, spiritual development. Um, this kind of theory of change that came to me in 72 about how psychedelics could produce these spiritual experiences that would have political implications was uh, sort of affirmed uh, 11 years later by a book that I read, Robert Mueller, and then I eventually met him. Robert Mueller was the Assistant Secretary General of the UN. He had been there, um, not, he ended up being there for 40 years. He was the mystic at the UN. And this book, uh, basically what he's saying is that uh, we have the United Nations to mediate conflicts between countries, but a lot of those conflicts are religious-based, and so we need to be able to move from um, fundamentalism to a deeper spirituality, a global spirituality, where we realize that we have more in common with each other than we have separate, and we can celebrate differences rather than be frightened by them. So this kind of connection to others and also connection to nature is really, I think, what um, is mass mental health, what we're trying to do. And psychedelics are not the only way that people can have these experiences, but they're one of the more reliable and one of the more rapid ways with enough support. So I ended up writing letters to Robert Mueller. He responded to me and we met in person and, um, and he basically said, yes, psychedelic research is really important. And he tried to help us bring back psychedelic research after several decades of suppression. Um, a recent study that was done at Imperial College in London with psilocybin that George will talk to you about soon um, demonstrated that the mystical experience was correlated with increased nature relatedness, decreased authoritarian political views. So this is just a modern um, reaffirmation of, again, this theory of change, that integrating psychedelics into our cultures and helping people have these experiences in legal supported ways has profound and important political way, uh, benefits. Uh, so in addition to that aspect of spirituality, there's also this uh, multi-generational trauma. So this is a picture of uh, Richard Rockefeller, who became my thought partner for about five years before he died in a plane crash. He was chairman of the Board of Advisors of Doctors Without Borders. And so he got very interested in um, Serbia and Kosovo and how, how do we end up treating hundreds of thousands, millions of people that are traumatized. And there's not enough doctors, not enough therapists. and, and he got very interested in what the potential of MDMA could be. So not only can you really help heal trauma from individuals, but we learn more and more now about epigenetics and how it's possible for trauma to be passed down from generation to generation. And this goes some ways to help explaining why we can have conflicts that can last hundreds of years, thousands of years sometimes. Um, and MDMA can break these cycles of trauma within one generation, within one therapy session sometimes, within one day. And so that's another aspect of what psychedelics can do. Um, and we're testing this out. It turns out in Israel there's groups of uh, Israelis, Israeli Arabs, Israeli Jews, and Palestinians who are doing ayahuasca together. Ayahuasca is a tea from South America that's psychedelic, and they're also doing MDMA together. So we're doing interviews with these people, and we're trying to understand then how we can move 
to help people in conflict areas um, move through their trauma and try to see the uh, the other as an in, as human beings and try to f build bridges. So that's the big picture of why I think this is so important. But before we're going to be able to really have legal contexts for spiritual use of psychedelics out side of some very narrow religions, really we're going to have to medicalize. So as a strategy, uh, MAPS, the nonprofit that I started 33 years ago, we did a lot of analysis of what is, of all the psychedelics and of all the patient population, what's the combination that we could put together that would be most likely to make it through the regulatory system? And so from that, really it came out that MDMA was the gentlest of all the psychedelics. It's the easiest to integrate. It doesn't really dissolve one's ego the way the classic psychedelics do. So it's, it's the mildest, the gentlest. And we had to look at what are patient populations that the culture appreciates. And so we looked around and veterans, uh, women survivors of childhood sexual abuse, adult rape and assault, they're, they're sympathetic patients. And so with drugs that are so controversial and have been so demonized as psychedelics, we really had to find ways to tell a story to the culture. And so we ended up deciding to focus on MDMA for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is just to say that it's not just me. We have now a team of 50 people working full time and we have um, lots of um, hundreds now of therapists that we've trained. But this, this is a story of the, the scale of the problem in a way. Um, right now, well this is two and a half years ago, it's very hard to get information from the Veterans Administration, but there was 868,000 vets receiving disability for PTSD. There's over a million right now. And the last time the VA put out numbers of what it cost, it was 20,000 average per year for disability payments for a vet on PTSD, disabled with PTSD. So that's roughly $20 billion a year right now. And then if you look at all the other uh, mental disorders that veterans uh, have fallen prey to, you could say, then you know, it's upwards of $30 billion a year. We have not yet got a single penny from the Veterans Administration or the Department of Defense to do this research. But the other main thing to keep in mind is there are way more people that have PTSD from non-military causes, from sexual abuse, from rape, from car accidents, sometimes physical illnesses. Um, the scale of the problem is vast. Just in America alone, there's 8 to 10 million people with PTSD. And if you look around the world, hundreds of millions of people have PTSD, and this is the cost roughly. Um, so to give you a sense of what it is that we're talking about, I have a video here. It's just two minutes and 20 seconds, but we videotape all the therapy sessions. And so, you know, sometimes it's hard for people to understand the differences between MDMA, known also as ecstasy or um, Molly, um, and the classic psychedelics. So this is um, a Marine veteran. This took place over 10 years ago, this particular therapy session. And what he was struggling with was rage. He had come back from the war. Um, you know, people are trained quite a lot to go to war, but when they come back, they're not really trained to reintegrate into society. And so he had a lot of incidents of rage. And uh, he never actually beat up his wife, but he threw things, and he felt this was uncontrolled. And that was one of the things that drove him to therapy. So uh, this video, then, is a compilation you'll see um, how he's describing what's going on. And um, this is his first MDMA session. Um, and here we go. I never realized how much I, I thought I was being a peaceful person, but I didn't realize how much I was punishing that, that, that aspect of me. Mm. Mm. I think I was just, I think maybe in Iraq, I saw what it was capable of. And I think I was too afraid to, Mm -hmm. You know, and a part of me just feels like so bad that I, I did that to him. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I know it's me, but I just mm -hmm. describe yeah. it wisely. Who are you? Um, yeah. yeah. But I just, mm -hmm. that was really amazing. And I, I don't know, I just got this amazing sense of just, I guess wisdom. I really don't know. Mm. Mm. Sounds a lot like wisdom to me. 
And it was, it was really amazing. And even when I try and think of that really rageful aspect of me, like I can't even, I know it's there, but it just doesn't, it, I really feel like so much more at peace with like mm -hmm. everything. Right. Like even if I try and think about Iraq and everything, like I somehow feel like really peaceful about the fact that that's my journey and that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Part of me think I mean, I mean, I know this is um, part of the, uh, you know, part of the drug, but when I try and think, you know, am I going to be able to hold on to this, um, this understanding, and this um, somewhat of wisdom, this knowledge that I have now? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, just asking myself that question, I feel like it's so profound that I don't think I could really forget it. And, and so, as I said, that's uh, over 10 years ago, and he's still free of PTSD. Um, so MDMA itself was um, invented in 1912 by Merck. Um, they were making a series of drugs to evade a competitor's patent. They didn't know what they had. Um, they didn't really um, test it in humans at all. Um, I recently was in China speaking about MDMA too, where, where uh, one of our donors said that um, when we had the psychedelic revolution in, in the United States and in Europe, they had the cultural revolution in China and his parents and all of their generation is traumatized. So he's um, helping us try to introduce MDMA to China. Um, but it was really reinvented in the middle 70s, um, MDMA was by Sasha Shulgin. Uh, the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 criminalized all psychedelics, and a lot of chemists then tried to modify the molecules to come up with something that was legal, and he uh, com came up with MDMA. And then he shared it with a fellow, Leo Zeff, who was, um, we called him the secret chief. He was the leader of the underground psychedelic therapy movement, and he's the one that really came out of retirement to uh, train hundreds of psychiatrists and psychotherapists in the use of MDMA. But while this was happening, um, some of the people that used MDMA in therapeutic settings decided that more people should have access to it, that they could make a lot of money, and they turned it into ecstasy. And so it was clear that this was uh, doomed. And so in the summer of 84, uh, the DEA moved to criminalize MDMA. Um, uh, if you can see, that's me there in the background, um, spying on the DEA. Um, this is right before I walked into the door uh, to file for a hearing. The DEA had no knowledge whatsoever that MDMA had been used in therapeutic settings. They only knew about it as a recreational drug, even though half a million doses had been used in therapy settings, but they were private settings, they were quiet, they were responsible. And so we were uh, able to take them completely by surprise. We had good legal representation. We got a hearing and we actually um, won the hearing. The DEA administrative law judge said it should be made illegal for recreational use, but it should stay legal as a medicine. But the administrator of the DEA um, emergency scheduled MDMA in 1985, this is Gene Hayslip, um, and then overruled the judge and rejected the recommendation of the judge. So in 1986, um, I started MAPS. And so it, it was a, an act of desperation. The only way to develop this drug, to bring back the therapeutic use, was going to be through the FDA. But the pharmaceutical companies weren't going to pay for research. The government wasn't going to pay for research. Um, so I thought, OK, we're just going to have to do it all through donations. And um, we created this nonprofit uh, psychedelic pharmaceutical company. Um, luckily, I was blissfully unaware that no drug had ever been made into a medicine by a nonprofit. Um, that didn't happen for another uh, 13 years, and that was the um, abortion pill, RU486. RU so controversial drug abandoned by the pharmaceutical industry, and uh, three wealthy families, the Rockefellers, the Buffets, and the Pritzkers, put a bunch of money into making RU486, but I, that came later. So I started MAPS in 1986. Um, from 86 to 92, the first six um, 
protocols that we submitted to the FDA, five protocols, were all rejected. But then what happened was that the people at the FDA that were in charge of research with Schedule I drugs shifted to a new division. And that division decided that they would put science before politics and let this research go forward. And so in 1992, um, the FDA approved our first study, and this was a phase one dose response safety study at Harbor UCLA with uh, Charlie Grobe. That uh, took us through most of the 90s, and then uh, in 2000, we started doing work with PTSD patients, finally um, getting into patients. And our first study, the one on the left, was um, a study in Spain. We had an international strategy. While that was going, we had some really good media in Spain, but the um, Spanish Anti-Drug Authority decided that they wanted to shut the study down. And so we, we didn't have the political um, connections to keep the study going. So that was heartbreaking. And it was uh, ended early. Uh, but then we started trying to do research in the US. We got FDA approval. And it took us uh, four years to get institutional review board approval. Um, seven RIBs rejected or refused to rev uh, approve a study that the FDA had already approved. Um, but finally, I looked through the list of uh, institutional review boards. There was about 29 of them, private ones, and one of them had the name Copernicus. And I just figured out of desperation, we actually started our own IRB, but I thought it would be better if we could be authorized by somebody outside. Um, and so I figured if anybody would be sympathetic to um, science being suppressed by religion or politics, it would be people that uh, named themselves after Copernicus. And as it turned out, I was right, and they ended up approving our study, finally. Um, and then we, we uh, published several studies. One was uh, the initial project, uh, and then the other was a three and a half year follow-up, so that we were showing that the results were durable. Um, then we just published uh, in Lancet Psychiatry, uh, work with veterans, firefighters, and police officers. Now, this was, again, a political choice. We wanted to work with veterans, but I thought, well, just put the name out there in the title firefighters and police officers, just to kind of communicate that this is really for the mainstream for first responders. And we actually got three firefighters, including one that had PTSD from 9-11, being at the Ground Zero in New York. And then we actually got one police officer. So this is kind of showing, again, that it's really for the whole culture, not just, you know, aging hippies. <laughs> um, and so it took us basically 16 years to do all of the phase two studies. The purpose of phase two studies is to plan phase three. And so what we learned is that our treatment works regardless of the cause of PTSD. There's uh, two drugs, SSRI, Zoloft and Paxil, that are approved by the FDA for PTSD. And these two drugs um, work better in women than in men, and they don't work in combat-related PTSD. So we learned that our treatment works regardless of the cause of PTSD. We also learned that low doses, um, I wrote my dissertation a lot on um, methodologically, how do you do double blind study with psychedel psychedelic drugs where you generally know if you've taken them. Um, and so I thought the solution would be um, low doses versus full doses, but it turned out that unfortunately, um, low doses made people agitated. They didn't really reduce the fear, and so the therapy with inactive placebo actually did better than if you add low-dose MDMA. So when we went to the FDA, we said there's no solution to the double-blind problem. Um, and we recommended inactive placebo, because the real question is, if you can do it with therapy, why bother add a drug? And so we figured, okay, we'll, we'll propose that, and FDA did accept that. We also learned that we could do it safely, and then we learned that we had a, a medium to large effect size, which means that the drug is, is um, remarkably effective. And so based on all of this, 16 years, now it's 30 years after I started MAPS, we went to have what's called an end of phase two meeting with the FDA. And that's where you present all your data and you say, okay, now I'm ready to go to phase three. And the FDA was very sympathetic and uh, they said, yes, we could go to phase three. Now this is what we presented to them. Data from um, these different studies in the United States, Switzerland, Canada, and Israel, 107 patients, and what we showed was that the therapy with inactive placebo, the control group, chronic severe treatment-resistant PTSD people, and it's basically three and a half months of therapy with three MDMA sessions one month apart and 12 90-minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions. 
three before the first MDMA session to prepare and three after each MDMA session for integration and it's a male female co-therapist team. So it's two therapists for one person. A lot of times people who have PTSD um, have multiple layers of trauma, have childhood trauma, and so having a well-functioning male-female team often replaces for people what they never had as they were growing up. And so we showed that we had 23% of the people in the control group no longer had PTSD at our um, two-month follow-up. So that's actually really pretty good compared to other therapies. But when you add MDMA, it more than doubles to 56%. And what we showed at the 12-month follow-up is that once you help people learn that they don't have to suppress their traumas and suppress their fears, that there's a way that they can process them and not be overwhelmed, that people keep getting better. So at the 12-month follow-up, two-thirds of these people no longer have PTSD. And of, it, it's, yeah. Um, and, of the, the group that still has PTSD, a lot of them have had clinically significant reductions of their PTSD symptoms. So um, this is just to show that we do use questionnaires of spiritual mystical nature to evaluate how uh, profound these sort of mystical experiences. These are the same questionnaires that are used all throughout the United States in research with um, psilocybin that we used in our studies in Switzerland with LSD. And what we showed is that people really do have a fair amount of uh, high scores on uh, this mystical experience questionnaire, even with MDMA. Um, but the more important thing is that we showed that there's no correlation between the mystical experience and therapeutic outcomes. And that's fundamentally different than the work with um, psilocybin and the early work with LSD from the 50s and 60s and the more recent. There is this correlation between the depth of this transcendent spiritual experience and how well the patients do. But for MDMA, that doesn't hold. So what that means really is that to help people overcome trauma, they have to be uh, grounded in their biography. They have to go back to the trauma and reevaluate it, but not when they're triggered emotionally, but from a place of safety, which is what the drug fundamentally does. The drug gives people the tolerance to go through the process of therapy. Um, and so on the basis of that, we, we got permission to go to phase three, and then we entered into this um, seven month process with the FDA called Special Protocol Assessment. And this is where you negotiate every aspect of your phase three designs and all the other information that FDA is gonna to wanna to see in order to decide whether to approve the drug as a medicine. And so um, if you get an agreement letter, the FDA is legally bound to approve the drug if you get statistically significant evidence of efficacy and no new safety problems come. And since tens and tens of millions of people have done MDMA, and if you look in Medline, where the world's uh, repository of medical scientific literature is, there's over 5,000 papers on MDMA, which we guess has estimated cost around $400 million, mostly governments trying to find out what's wrong. So we, we have a very good idea of the safety profile. So this um, special protocol assessment was very, very important. Um, but then also, we were able to get breakthrough therapy. So this is a designation from the FDA, the most promising drugs. In a sense, if you get breakthrough therapy, FDA is now partnering with you to try to make it into a medicine. So this was really productive for us that we got breakthrough therapy. And then this is the design that we agreed with. Um, three MDMA sessions. The first one is going to be 80 milligrams. Two hours later, we give 40. The second session, likely people are going to go up to 120 and then two hours later, 60. And then they'll discuss with the therapist and the patients what to do on the third session. So this is the agreement for the phase three design. But what's even more astonishing, so we think that in 2021, we'll have uh, the data and we anticipate that FDA is likely, if the data works out, to approve the drug in 2021, the end of it. But this summer, we're actually gonna be able to open up psychedelic clinics under this expanded access program. And it's basically compassionate use. So what it means is that um, if, if there is a, a drug, if somebody is suffering from a disease and they've tried all the drugs that are available and they haven't worked, and there's a drug that's being studied for that condition, in addition to the double-blind placebo-controlled studies, people should have an a the right to access the drug on a compassionate basis at their own risk, because it's not through the FDA, and also at their own cost. And so we're gonna be able to train therapists. We are training them right now. We actually have a training this week 
uh, in Asheville, um, North Carolina. And what's really, uh, and we're training people for expanded access. But what's so great about that training is that we have three uh, therapists from the Bronx Veterans Administration. We have one psychiatrist from the Army and his wife who's a therapist. And we even have a police psychologist who's coming to learn about giving MDMA to other police officers with trauma. So these expanded access clinics, which will be opening up this summer, will eventually be able to administer um, MDMA, psilocybin, ketamine. These will become sort of full service psychedelic psychotherapy clinics. Um, we've developed this manualized therapeutic method that this is up on our website if anybody wanted to learn how we describe how people are supposed to be um, helping others. But the basic idea is that we don't use the word guide. We don't um, think of ourselves as the guide, that the person's unconscious is the guide. So we call it interdirected therapy. So we support the individual as they go through this eight hour MDMA session in whatever order they want, whatever is coming up, eventually they will talk about the trauma, but sometimes they talk about happy memories, different memories, uh, but we support it in this, uh, and it's like midwives. The best way to understand what, what the therapists are is they're midwives. The work has to be done by the person who's going to be healing themselves. The woman has to give birth by herself, but we can provide support. Um, so we have different parts of the training program, online parts, week-long training programs. We have a protocol where we can give MDMA to therapists as part of their training, and um, we have them engaged in role play. Um, we do have a, the final piece is they work with one patient under supervision in the exact same protocol as uh, phase three. And so we're gonna have a diploma uh, that we give to people. Now, we think it should be optional if they choose to take MDMA. We don't want to require anybody take MDMA, but we think therapists will be a lot more effective if they've taken it themselves. Um, so we think patients should be able to know what their therapists have done. So we have this other diploma <laughs> for those that have decided to take the MDMA. <laughs> um, um, the FDA has what's called REMS, the Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategies. And these are policy levers that the FDA has to tailor to the risks of particular drugs. And so what we've already negotiated with FDA is once MDMA is a medicine, not everybody will be able to prescribe it. The only people that can prescribe it are people that we have trained. And the only people that can be in direct contact with the patients are therapists and psychiatrists that we have trained. It's only administered under direct supervision. It's never a take-home drug. There's a centralized pharmacy that we're going to ship from one place to all the different uh, doctors who have the Schedule One licenses to do it, and there's certain kind of safety screening. And the things below the line are things that the FDA has not required of us, uh, patient registry and maximum lifetime doses. That's still to be negotiated, but so far they've not indicated that they want to do that with us. Um, to give you a sense of how large this can grow, there's 14,500 drug abuse treatment centers just in America, 6,000 hospice centers, 33,000 yoga and Pilates studios. So there will be thousands and thousands of psychedelic therapy centers in the US and even more throughout Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, some of them will be like this, the beautiful ones. Some of them will be storefronts like this. Eventually you'll go to Google Maps and you'll say, where are all the psychedelic clinics? Uh, here's the ones in Europe. And, uh, what I want to emphasize here is that we've been able to get bipartisan support for what we do. We, we're about to start this $30 million experiment. We've raised uh, $28 million right now. Um, and Rebecca Mercer, who was the main funder of Trump, and Steve Bannon, and Breitbart, and Cambridge Analytica, they've given us a $1 million, with the only condition that it be limited to veterans. Um, so on one side, we have Rebecca Mercer and the Mercer family. On the other side, we have George Soros. <laughs> So he's given us 70,000 to support a training for therapists of color. Um, and this is the, um, the final point of my talk is that the, um, Ronald Reagan signed into law incentives for drugs that are off, uh, off patent. And so what data exclusivity means is that no one can use your data. If the drug is off patent, there's no use patents. Nobody can use your data to market a generic for five years, and in Europe it's 10 years. And if you do studies in adolescence, it's six months, and it takes the FDA at least six months to review. So we'll probably have six years of data exclusivity for marketing MDMA. This is uh, what you get from that. 
And so the way that we've structured things, we're trying not just to bring forward a new approach to mental uh, health, which is psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, but we're also trying to demonstrate a new way to market drugs. And so we have MAPS, which is a nonprofit, and we thought now if we can supplement the uh, income that we get from donors with income from sales of MDMA, that that would be um, a good way for us to plan. But we don't want it to be in a profit maximizing company. We want it to be in a MAPS public benefit corp where we maximize public benefit over profit. So we have the public benefit corp that's 100% owned by MAPS. So that's the structure. And um, we're also going to Europe. And um, if you can see on the very, um, end row is uh, George Goldsmith. He was, uh, helped us greatly in our European strategy. And now um, George will talk to us about the work that he's doing with psilocybin. Thank you. Okay, um, Mike is on. Cool, is the presentation coming up? Yes, thanks so much. Okay, there we are. Um, so, it's all about re this week, isn't it? So I want to talk about reimagining mental health care. And I think Rick did an amazing job. Well, he's been doing an amazing job for 30 years. Um, <clears throat> did an amazing job kind of outlining the fact that there is a new way to be thinking about mental health care. Uh, we're building on that uh, amazing work that uh, Rick has done, but working with a very different substance, uh, <clears throat> uh, psilocybin. I'll give you just a two secs. I'm not going to repeat for all of you who were at my other talks earlier in the week, that talk. I want to really talk much more kind of about the problem that we're addressing. Um, we did get to this for those people who weren't at that talk through a real personal challenge in our family where our son was just unable to be helped by any traditional medicine uh, and traditional psychiatry. So we went through uh, a huge, huge hell uh, dealing with that. So um, that led us to become motivated and find new things. I'm a serial entrepreneur, guilty as charged. I built businesses and collaboration software, I sold it to Lotus, built businesses with McKinsey and Company. And before our son became ill, I had the privilege of working with regulators, governments, and uh, major pharma, looking at how do we bring the right medicine to patients at a cost society can afford. That's work in process, clearly. Um, and so I had a benefit of a lot of uh, interactions with regulators. We're taking a little bit of a different tack. So I think if I would do the major headline for Rick, it's how do we really integrate these medicines and these tools in society? Um, that's a huge task. We decided to take on something a little bit more manageable. Some days we think it's a little more manageable, which is how do we integrate these substances into our healthcare systems around the world. By the way, despite my accent, I'm based in London, and uh, we've been doing a lot of work, uh, transatlantic work, uh, that we've been doing. But you can see that our mission here is not about psychedelics. It's actually about bringing innovation to patients. And there are many innovations now that are present. One that was even approved yesterday afternoon, which is a actually an illicit drug uh, tranquilizer that's now been repurposed and approved by the FDA as of yesterday called esketamine. So there is an openness that we can see in, in the world around us for new tools. And God knows, do we need new tools? So our first initiative is actually developing psilocybin therapy, but we're bringing that together with therapists and with technologies and really a whole different payer proposition so that we can keep people healthy longer. And that's our whole focus. Um, we're starting with depression, and depression, it's uh, just a huge problem. Uh, I mean, the scale of it's just stunning. Right now, based on best estimates of people who are diagnosed, there are 320 million worldwide. Um, and it's a belief that, in general, depression is underreported by approximately 50%. Um, so it's a huge problem. We have tools that work for some, SSRIs, various medicines. That's terrific for the people it helps. Unfortunately, nearly a third of people are not helped by those medicines. So there's a huge public health issue um, that manifests itself in huge cost. And the huge cost, you can see, is about 300 billion pounds. Uh, so it's about 30% more in dollars. And that's actually old figures. And that's looking at the cost of care, the cost of absenteeism, the cost of medicine, et cetera. So this is really a very big deal problem. 
Um, and it's affecting so many of us, and we can kind of see that at the beginning of the session. So we're in the midst of an epidemic that we just don't like to talk about very much. But the total costs of, can of depression are nearly equal to the combined cost of diabetes and cancer, just to give you a sense of how big that is, okay? Um, the other thing that's really sad, this is the only time in medicine where we've had a tremendous number of new medicines coming into the market. So there's been an 80-fold increase since 1985 of prescriptions in depression. There's also been a 40-fold increase in depression. This is the only time when you have medicines introduced that the problem is getting worse, not better. So that's an interesting thing. We can speculate a different time about why that might be. Um, we're also looking at other things because of the unique model of what psilocybin does, and I'll have a quick video about that so people kind of can demystify this a little bit. Um, but what's really amazing about this is that it's a substance that can be used across a number of different kinds of mental health suffering, ranging from anxiety, depression, chronic pain, alcohol dependence, and there are early studies in all these different areas. What we're doing is we've built a company uh, because we felt it was actually the easiest way to provide access to capital. We've raised about 40 million uh, in the last 18 months. Uh, we are doing this at scale uh, in, and really very uh, blessed in many ways by the progress we've made and the, the raises of value. We're now a several hundred million dollar company. Um, so let's talk a little bit or hear a little bit. I want to give you a patient perspective on this a scientist perspective, the former head of the U.S. National Institute of Mental Health's perspective, and the former head of the U.K.'s drug regulator. And we're going to do that in four minutes, so hang on. I think we're doing it in four minutes. Could we get the video to go? There we are. If only my father hadn't been an alcoholic. If only I'd asked for help earlier. If I'd done this, if I'd done that. The guilt of, you know, when someone's gone, there's something you can do. I think it's the, the deepest sadness I've ever had, you know. After uh, my mum died, I was just falling into that space that's left by her. I didn't want to let go. In states such as depression, you could characterize it as a kind of literal depression. I mean, depression meaning a sort of depression in the earth, you know, a, 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 like a hole, a pit. We've got a group of disorders, depression and other mental disorders that cause enormous disability. And we have treatments, but the treatments still aren't where we want them to be. But we are on the edge of a new era. We're now looking at the opportunities to put medications together with psychotherapies. We can combine those in some interesting new ways. And that really may be the way to optimize outcomes. What we see under psilocybin and magic mushrooms and psychedelics more generally is an ability to step out, to step back, like an astronaut who goes up into space, all of a sudden can see the whole of the Earth and then thinks, why was I worrying about this or that? It allows the mind and the brain to operate really in a more expansive way. During the psilocybin experience, I saw the grief as a kind of poison. I had a realisation that, that I, I was using that to hang on to my my mum, but that was that was poisoning me. After the the experience, the psilocybin experience, I had a sense of optimism, the space around me again. It has such a huge impact. We're trying to find out what's the biological basis of this experience. We're finding that really it's, it's two things. It's the breaking down of a particular brain system or network that normally preserves and maintains our sense of self or ego. But what goes alongside the breakdown of that system is a, a new configuration which could be characterized as a sort of unification in the brain to an extent. 
You have systems and regions that are normally apart from each other, so separate, disconnected, now becoming more, more connected. What you've got to do is to forget all the mumbo jumbo that happened in the 1960s. This is a, this is a, a, a different drug, new drug being used in a different way, different doses, different people, uh, people with defined, highly defined disease. And this is, this is the great interest, this is the great challenge. In terms of the data that we're seeing, the brain imaging data, after a psychedelic experience, we're finding that the brain and the mind settles back into healthy configurations, that it reforms itself and it seems to reform itself in a healthier way. I think it's incumbent on everyone, the developer, the regulator, the public health doctors, to make sure that the best evidence is gathered for psilocybin so that a good assessment can be made as to whether it is a valuable addition uh, to medicines that we have today. This is a scientific question. We need to be able to do the research to find out what works and what works for whom. But I think for the first time we can begin to see where we want to go. I've been in this field a long time, um, and long enough to get a bit cynical. Uh, in this area, I'm actually quite excited, enthusiastic, to say that maybe there is an opportunity here to provide something of real value to patients who have real need. I would have been like a uh, 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 kind of stick in the mud. But now I'm more, I'm more like a reed, you know. There's a bit more bend in me. Great. Um, the reason I wanted to share that is this is a very unusual kind of treatment, and so to just have some perspectives on that from others is, is always a little bit comforting, I think. Um, what I, you'll see on the screen, I'll just share a couple more things, that the patients who go through this have a tremendous experience. This is not like taking an SSRI. This is done in a very carefully supported environment, just the way Rick described, preparation of therapist with you, and we have one, and then um, a integration process. One of the things that's fascinating about this is that one of the research teams at Johns Hopkins that was doing work in this area, um, basically asked one month after the psilocybin experience, could you please rank the level of meaningfulness in your life that this experience one month ago had? And people asked, well, what do you mean by meaningfulness? Was it hanging out with friends? No, it was actually like the birth of your children or your marriage or the death of your parents. Nearly 75% said it was among the top five most meaningful experiences of their life and nearly one-third said it was the most meaningful experience of their life. So this is something quite powerful. It's quite a huge responsibility for stewardship. Uh, we're a UK company, so we can't maximize around profit. We can only maximize around stakeholder value, and we take that very seriously, including investors. And I think that where we are right now is uh, we have also received FDA breakthrough designation, I'm pleased to say, last October. And uh, we are now uh, starting, we've just concluding the world's largest trial with healthy volunteers. That's uh, six people in uh, London every Thursday receive psilocybin on cognitive safety and problem solving benefit. That's just wrapping up. And we're starting a new 216 person study in treatment resistant depression, ranging from Stanford to uh, the Czech Republic. Uh, and that's uh, now underway, and uh, we hope with that that we're going to make a real difference. And if you want to get in touch, that's how to do it. For Rick, for us, and uh, really appreciate your time, and I didn't want to take too much of it because I know we have some questions, I assume. If, if people have questions, we have two mics in the back of the room. They can come. So before, before we get to questions, I wanted to, you know, on behalf of everyone, obviously, thank uh, Rick and George for the incredible work they're doing, as well as a, a really engaging presentation. And the one thing up there that I wanted to point out is that this whole issue where mental health and psychedelic medicines are stigmatized or hidden or you can't talk about it, we're addressing very directly here in YPO. There's now a group, a, an official YPO group on mental health, uh, mental health and psychedelic medicines and I'd encourage you to just 
join, learn more. To the extent you're interested, there will be action forums created of people who want to discuss and or explore possible actions. And there are also a number of chapter programs that are being done. So if you're interested in any of that, just, just let me know. Um, yes. Dick, I just wanted to add to that for a second. One of the things that is a long, I've been in YPO for 20 years on the board for four, and I think that as champions, I think it's really um, important that we can talk about this stuff. So I think for us, you know, what, what was really beautiful, I think, in the earlier sessions this week was that we could actually start talking about this. You know, sometimes our forums even get kind of competitive about how healthy we are. Um, so I just think it's, right? <laughs> it's a wonderful opportunity because I can't tell you how many YPOers came up to me in the last 24 hours with personal stories. Uh, and I think this is a really beautiful opening that you're doing. That all of us are doing. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you, George. So, yes, questions. Uh, well, you, you've got a mic. So, speak into the microphone. Hi. Thanks. Great talk. Very inspirational. And, and agree. It's good to talk about such things. I have two questions. The first, a very quick one. The, the psilocybin, are you giving people magic mushrooms or is it a synthesized uh, Okay. Version? Yes. And my second question is really downside risk. You know, with, particularly with MDMA, you hear a lot of stories people dying. You don't really hear that with mushrooms apart from maybe jumping off a building. Um, what are the downside risks, physical, emotional? What, what are the horror stories that maybe you're not sharing? Um, so I can start that with psilocybin and then yeah. you can. Um, so um, I want to be very clear. No mushrooms are harmed in our studies. Um, <laughs> uh, we use a synthetic form of psilocybin because uh, the first meeting we had with regulators was say we have a really important requirement of you that you can make medicine at scale. Look at how many millions of people. So we need you to be able to produce this. It needs to be the same everywhere in the world, every time in the world. So that was a couple of years of activity for us to develop uh, synthesized psilocybin to the highest global standards, which we've done. Uh, in terms of the downside risk, I think this is the, the number one headline is do not try this at home because we do very careful screening. We do very careful screening of prior psychotic issues, anything that might cause a problem. Now, I say that because sometimes people can develop a, a real sense of almost invulnerability in the, the experiences and so forth. So that's why we're in a very carefully controlled environment. Feels more like a living room than a clinic. Soft lights, amazing music soundtrack, eye shades. It's an inner journey supported and, and, and really helped just like uh, Rick and his team do. Um, I think what's really important in this work is that we acknowledge that we have a lot to learn. Uh, the downside risks of supported work uh, are virtually nil, so much so that the FDA did something. I mean, no one has been had difficulties in the actual clinical work. This is something that happens when you take it out in the real world. And, and the last thing I would just say is that the FDA was so comfortable with the safety profile that they actually asked us to expand what we were looking at rather than contract and to look at less seriously ill patients. That doesn't happen often at the FDA. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll contrast psilocybin with MDMA. So psilocybin is part of uh, a group of the classic psychedelics like LSD, uh, mescaline from peyote, and those drugs are safer physiologically than MDMA but riskier psychologically. And so MDMA riskier physiologically, but safer psychologically. However, we need to distinguish between what happens in the recreational settings and what happens in the clinical settings. So people can die from MDMA, and that has happened where people um, overheat, they get hyperthermia, they dance all night, they, don't, uh, they do it in hot environments, they don't drink adequate uh, fluid replacements, and so that has happened a couple times um, people also have heard harm reduction drink water uh, to cool down, and sometimes people have drank too much water and die from hyponatremia, where you dilute your blood. But in a clinical setting, none of that really happens. We're monitoring people. Um, there's a slight rise in temperature. Uh, there are significant rises in blood pressure, but um, we're giving uh, fluids, not water, but we do uh, Gatorade or electrolytes. So we've, we've had no significant serious adverse events in the clinical studies. Um, the other thing to say is when I was um, meeting the head of the Bronx VA just a couple weeks ago and we were talking about doing a study inside the Bronx VA, 
he asked that same question. But what he said was, has anybody ever committed suicide in your study? And so that has never happened. And then what I told him is that we don't exclude people that have had prior attempts at suicide. A lot of clinical studies won't work with people if they have attempted suicide in the past. So we include people that have attempted suicide. Um, PTSD does drive people to commit suicide sometimes. But um, from the, uh, the position of the FDA, it's really safe. The other thing I want to say is the picture that I showed you with um, uh, George that was in it right after our meeting with the European Medicines Agency, um, we had this meeting. It was to go over the designs for phase three, and we had several people from uh, MAPS from the U.S. on the phone. And it, you meet them for about an hour, and then you go off on your own, and then a couple weeks later they send you uh, written comments. So what happened in this particular meeting is it went well. We went off to our room to talk, but um, later I found out that the EMA people had not turned off the microphones to the people that had called in from the United States, from our team. So they were able to listen in on the discussions of the EMA regulators. Um, they didn't turn it off, but, but what they heard was that the EMA people said they've convinced us of safety, now they just have to prove efficacy. Th thank you, Rick. Um, qu question, you, you mentioned briefly about uh, iOS guy use in, yeah. in Israel. Can yeah. you share a little bit the, the results that you see, uh, that you saw, as well as uh, your thoughts on DMT? Yeah. Um, th the first thing to say is that those people that are in conflict areas that are willing to engage in these mixed spaces with people from, you know, other cultures, that these are not the diehard, you know, haters from both sides. So these are, we're already starting with the people that are the most open-minded. And so what we're finding is that, in a sense, this is going to be like training the trainers, that these are the people that are willing to make these bridges, once they, but they still have a lot of traumas from their own background. So we're just um, interviewing people now for the first year. We've not yet done a controlled study. But what we found is that, at least so far, the people are all coming to this for their individual healing as their primary purpose. They're not seeing this as necessarily a way to bridge the divides between the different cultures. And what we're also seeing is that they need to work through their individual traumas before they can really build those bridges together. So that there's a lot of preparation work in just helping people um, work through different I issues that they bring to it. So that there's a second stage that'll be more about addressing conflicts that they have. But they're also finding that um, people that come to these shared spaces, sometimes ayahuasca, sometimes MDMA, that they're able to really bring the lessons back and that they're able to um, want to continue to do these things. But whether it can, you know, have a big impact on a much wider scale is something that we'll only know over time and it will move slowly because, again, it's just the most open-minded of both sides. And as far as DMT, um, I think that DMT is the active ingredient in ayahuasca. It can also be smoked. I think uh, ayahuasca has incredible therapeutic potential. And that it's from the Amazon, it's usually used in those contexts, in certain syncretic religious contexts, but it has been taken outside of those contexts. Respectfully, it's been used in hospitals in Brazil for the treatment of depression, similarly to psilocybin. So I think there's just an enormous potential, but when you take DMT and smoke it, it takes only about 10 or 15 minutes. It's incredibly profound, but it's more inspirational than therapeutic. So I think the longer the duration actually is a good thing to work through a lot of psychological issues. Hi, Rick. Have you researched Ibogaine and how does MDMA differ? Ah. Um, we have research. Uh, Ibogaine is uh, the only uh, major uh, African psychedelic that's being used around the world. It's from Gabon. Uh, it's been used for hundreds, thousands of years for religious services. But it turns out that it has a remarkable property to, to take people who are addicted to opiates and it helps them go through the withdrawal in just a couple days. Much easier than normal. And it gives them profound psychological experiences where it brings up uh, a lot of the things that they've not wanted to see. So Ibogaine, unfortunately, is illegal in the U.S., but it's legal in Canada, legal in Mexico, legal in most of Europe, and so we've done observational studies in New Zealand and in Mexico 
that we just published in the journal, uh, American Journal of Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. Um, and it showed promise. Uh, we, we looked at people at baseline and then one month for a year every month uh, when they've gone to these clinics. And so I think it's just a tragedy that in the United States, uh, this last year, we had more people die of drug overdoses, not just opiates, but mostly opiates. So more people died of drug overdoses in one year in America than died in the entire Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq wars. And yet, Congress has not put a penny into Ibogaine or anything psychedelic. So we're currently trying to do, um, Ibogaine does have its risks even more so than MDMA in that it affects heart rhythms and some people have died under Ibogaine, but it can be administered in a medically supervised way where nobody should die. So we're currently uh, trying to design a protocol and raise two and a half million to do a phase one uh, dose response safety study with Ibogaine. I think it's very, very important. Yes, this is for both of you. Um, does any uh, uh, of these solutions apply to related disorders such as schizophrenia and that type of thing? Um, well, schizophrenics, psychotics, bipolar, personality disorders are all excluded from our studies. And so I think there could be benefit, but it wouldn't be done on an outpatient basis. Those people that are more severely ill would need more of a container before we can do those kind of studies. So I, I don't know that it would work for psychosis, for uh, bipolar, but it could, I think, work for, MDMA could work for schizophrenia, possibly. Um, but again, that's not, because of limited resources, we're sort of working at where we think it's most likely to work, but eventually we hope to explore that. And um, same thing on our side. We are looking at, there are some researchers at Stanford who are interested in looking at particular type of bipolar and we're exploring that, but it's very early days in addition. So I'm afraid we're only going to be able to oh. take two more questions. Oh. <laughs> but but uh, you, you can come is, up after and ask is, more questions. Uh, I see a microphone there and then you've had your Oh, hand. I see that one there. Maybe three oh, questions. Three, three, I'm sorry. <laughs> is there a limit to how many times this can be taken? Um, well, um, I've taken MDMA about 120 times um, <laughs> since 1982. So it's a long time, um, and I still get benefit from it. Um, the question is really more from the FDA's point of view. You know, the, the toxicity studies, what they're anticipating is that there will be like a 10 to 12 time lifetime limit for PTSD. And I would say that if people are taking MDMA for PTSD and they've had 10 or 12 sessions and they still have PTSD, it's not working and something else should be tried. Um, there is a factor that people talk about a lot that over time, many people say that the MDMA experience diminishes. And that's not the case with psilocybin or with marijuana or with LSD or anything like that. So there, there's something I think changing in some ways different with MDMA than with other drugs that in a way you could look at it as a good thing in the sense that it's a safeguard against drug abuse. So that most drugs that you get addicted to are you build a tolerance, you just keep taking more and more drugs to get the same feeling. So with MDMA, you go over time, for most people it will diminish, but when you take higher doses, you don't get the desired effect. You get more of the speedy um, amphetamine type reactions. So I think, um, and eventually what we're talking about really is psychedelic medicine and psychedelic clinics. So even for depression, for PTSD, it could be that people get a couple doses of MDMA and then they get some psilocybin. And then they go back to MDMA or they go to ayahuasca or DMT or something like that. So I, I think that in therapeutic applications, we're not gonna run up against any kind of limits as far as people doing it too often. Well, I think that it's really important that we, um, we've seen all the mischief making done by companies now who have people on lifetime antidepressants and they were never designed for that. So. I actually think that we have an ethical responsibility that if someone is not responding to this, and very few people respond to everything, so that we have to understand who's not responding and that if this doesn't work, they need to move on to other things. Um, so we would envision that that might be, again, somewhat similar to the 10 uh, or so lifetime. Because at that point, we know it doesn't work. In terms of reuse in people, uh, Allen Ginsberg, and after an LSD experience, had a wonderful statement. He said, if you get the, the message, hang up the phone. And so I think there's also, for some people, not a need to go back and forth in this, but in fact that there is 
a, a shift in the worldview, a shift in way people see themselves, the way they see their own narrative that isn't required repeat use uh, extensively. So just a thought. Hi, thank you. Um, first of all, I owe two people an apology generated from this. I'm a therapist and they're both my clients. One is a substance abuser and the other has other issues who told me about this and I was dismissive. So I just want to say thank you for stretching my own internal yardstick. I'm here. Yeah, right oh, oh, there you are. Everybody, I just kept looking. Yeah. You see, too many drugs. <laughs> or not enough. Uh, or not enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there's that. Then I just want to understand that what you said is that there's always a registered or a trained clinician mm. who is there, which certainly contains and makes a difference. And it seems that what they do, what the drug does, is accelerate the process that the therapist has been trying to mm -hmm. achieve for a long time by, say, picking up the fear that lies under the anger that the person wouldn't have been able to access or helping them see an alternative narrative about themselves. They've been acting on the same narrative that hasn't been able to be shifted for a long time. And the accessibility of the therapy just is accelerated and opens up. So I hope that I'm understanding it correctly. And then the last thing is that in South Africa, even with drugs that are registered with the FDA, we still have a problem with registration here. So we going to, if we're going to try and introduce it here, we're going to have to provide a great deal of data and motivate here with our own authorities, which are kind of recalcitrant sometimes and difficult to shift to be able to do it. I mean, I'd love to be an accredited therapist, but ah. to be able to, to, to use it. Yeah, well, um, on that point, so I've got an appointment on Friday to go to one of the PTSD research teams here at one of the hospitals to try to see if they want to start doing MDMA research here in South Africa. And we could provide training, we could provide MDMA, we can provide regulatory affair uh, relations. We'll have all sorts of data that we have to provide for FDA and EMA that we can bring here. So we do have training programs that, that I'd love to talk to you more about if you want to go through programs. The other part is that um, of the male-female team, so it's a two-person therapy team, and that's really unusual and expensive. And so, what, but it does seem to be most effective. So what we're saying is one of the two needs to have a license, but the other would be like a student or somebody that's just learning that would be either um, working for free to get a certain number of hours to get credentialed as a therapist or working at a lower rate. So one of the two needs to have a license as a therapist, but the other does not. Okay, one last oh. question and then. Yeah. Right. So, so we are at the end of our time. Wait, wait, However, one more question. No, wait, I, I just wanted to also uh, say that oh, the oh. people are welcome to come up afterwards, after, after this final question, and, and uh, Great. Uh, George and Rick will be here, and we'll be happy this to is, answer. This is the final question. <laughs> I'm currently undiagnosed. I'd much rather do this in a clinical setting than behind the barn. What do I do? <laughs> Um, well, you're going to have to wait. <laughs> I, I suggest you uh, think about the barn again. <laughs> um, be, because uh, initially, so we're anticipating actually 2035. So what I think is going to happen is that 2021. 2035? Well, here, 2021, MDMA becomes a medicine, legally available. And then it'll be a bit more than a decade where we roll out thousands of these psychedelic clinics and they'll start doing psilocybin, start doing MDMA, and we'll start changing public attitudes towards these drugs. And I think we'll be able to move to a post-prohibition world around 2035. And okay. so that's where people who are not, who doesn't, don't have a diagnosis would be able to legally access this. The, the only other way, and um, so we have a study that we've done with um, therapists with the VA called cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. So it's couples therapy where one member has PTSD, but it affects the relationship. And we're giving both members of the couple MDMA. It could eventually be where people who are depressed, but it affects their family members. You might, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're thinking about this one day, but you start bringing in the family. So maybe if you could have somebody that's got PTSD or depression in your family, then you could be the other healthy person in this uh, dyad. 
but I, I think really um, it will take quite a while. And plus, I think we're going to have to see the legalization of marijuana in the United States and in Canada and elsewhere for you know, a substantial amount of time going well before people are going to extend that to psychedelics. Great. So thank you all. I invite you to keep the conversation going. You know, let, let's not let this be secret. Um, let's share. I invite you to join the group. I certainly invite everybody to uh, come up with questions. And most importantly, a huge thank you to Rick and George.